Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Bismillah wa alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi sahbihi wa man wala. Three years ago from today, roughly three years ago from today, I met a young man who was born and raised in a Muslim country. Born and raised in an environment where he heard the adhan five times a day. Born and raised in an environment where he heard the Quran being recited five times a day. Born and raised in an environment where if he didn't pray in school, he'd probably get beat. Born and raised in an environment surrounded by Muslims. Imagine this masjid times 10,000. That was the community he was from. I met this young man on, on a cold, dark night in New York City, at New York University, and he had left Islam. He left Islam, he refused to believe in Allah, he became an agnostic. And I had some words with him. And from my conversation with him, he left Islam over something that's so heartbreaking for me personally. He left Islam, he refused to bow his head to Allah, he refused his ticket to Jannah because he had questions. He had questions and nobody wanted to answer them. In a Muslim society, in a Muslim uh, country, my dear respected elders, my dear uncles, my dear aunties, I have a message for you. Your younger as a younger brother, with all due humbleness and respect and love, if you do not see the younger generation thanking you, if you do not see the shabab having shukr of what you did, leaving your countries, coming here, establishing these beautiful masajid, establishing beautiful communities, establishing halal markets and, and so on and so forth to the point that I moved here a year and a half ago from New York City because I thought this is a great Muslim community. Ajrukum Allah. Your reward is with Allah. But I say now, my dear respected elders, it is no longer about infrastructure. You came, you built this masjid. You came, you built the community. The fitna of our deen today is aqal, is intellectual. Our youth are leaving the deen. I'll say it to you. People say Islam is the fastest growing religion. That's because religiosity is on the decline in general. People are leaving. Our shabab are leaving. Yaqeen Institute published an article that said about 25% of Muslim American youth do not identify as Muslim anymore. 25%, one fourth, one out of four shabab leave the deen. My beloved community, if that doesn't like send goosebumps down your, your spine, if that doesn't like rile you up, then wallahi we have a problem. It's not about the infrastructure. You got the million dollar masjid, you got the thousand dollar chandelier, you got the carpets, you got everything. Now it's time to invest in the aqad. It's time to invest in teaching our youth the academic, in-depth details of our deen. Because day upon day, they're being attacked. Day upon day, they're being surrounded by ideologies that are taking them away from God, taking them away from Islam in general. And that is why when I met that young man three years ago in New York City, Wallahi, the Prophet Sallallahu said, if you are to guide anybody to Islam, that is better for you than the whole world and everything in it. Now let's reverse it. If somebody, if a shabab, if our community leaves Islam because of our negligence, that is worse than losing the whole world and everything in it. That is worse than anything that could happen to us as a community. And that is why after Ramadan, Imam Khalil, Brother uh, Hussam, Dr. Yasin, and Brother Peru and myself, uh, we decided to start this Friday weekly series to answer the questions of our shabab, to answer the questions even of our respected elders. Who said elders don't have doubts? It's just they don't ask. Whereas the youth are a little brave, we ask. Every Friday, we made this for you, our community, that you can come, learn under esteemed leaders, mashaykh, imams, the in-depth details of our religion, and ask the daring questions. Ask the questions that you're embarrassed to ask. There will be a phone number put up on the screen where you can text your questions. You will text your questions to that number. Don't worry, none of us will know that it's you. None of us will recognize who it's coming from. And inshallah, Hussam and I will pick the top three to five questions and we will ask the Imam in front of everyone to inshallah answer that question. And inshallah, my brother Hussam come up and speak inshallah about the how of, of 
how we're going to do this, inshallah. Jazakallah khair, Brother Naveed, and um, thank you for that uh, inspiring story. And I don't like to have any of that happen to any one of our committee members, whether young or old. Yes, some people do have doubts. But alhamdulillah, we are believers. And that's why we're here. Otherwise, we're not going to be here. And that's our choice. We came to this masjid to attend this dars because we are believers, alhamdulillah. With that positive note, as a believer, you can also still ask questions. Not because you have serious doubts, but because always shaitan comes and does with was. And that's what shaitan's job is, to do with was. And the way to kick that with was is to do isti'ada. That's the simple way. But if you still couldn't kick it, and you still have iman, it's okay to ask the question. Ibrahim alayhi salam, he's a prophet. And he was asking Allah, God, arini kayfa tuhiyil mawta. So Allah asked him, awalam tu'min? Do you, do you not believe Ibrahim? He says, Bala, I do believe God, but liyatma'inna qalbi. So I get that assurance, confirmation. So we're coming from a believing standpoint, alhamdulillah. Therefore, the questions you're going to be asking, or oh, this topic is here to strengthen your iman, is to revive your iman. Think of it, let's say, as the Sahaba used to say, ta'alu nu'min sa'a. Let's come and have one hour of imaniyat to just strengthen our belief. This is not to cast doubts, it's to actually strengthen our Iman. Because when we are all together in the same boat, we will all have, inshallah, the same understanding and the same feeling. Therefore, questions are here to help you understand. The topics here help you to strengthen your faith and Aqeedah. Please, if you have serious questions which are not allowed, like don't ask us who created God. No one is going to answer this question. No one is allowed to ask this question. There are questions you're not allowed to ask them. Not because that means that you have something wrong with it, but they are not answerable. They're beyond what Allah gave ilm to any scholar or any, to any prophet. So there are questions they will never allow to be asked, but there are questions we will, inshallah, filter and see what's the beneficial to the community, inshallah, forward them to the imam or to the speaker. So we lined up, alhamdulillah, at least a, a program that should last us for about 10 months for now. Assuming Ramadan and sometimes in the Eid, we're not going to have sessions. So let's talk about about 10 months of sessions about Aqeedah, Imaniyat, the, the words of the unseen, Malaika, Jinn. We talk about Tawheed in the first session. The first month will be about Aqeedah, pure Aqeedah. Second month, inshallah, we're going to go over the attributes of Allah and Sifatullah, how we should understand them properly and benefit from them properly. We're going to move then to the unknowns, Qadr, Ghayb. And then the, after that, Malaika, Jinn, after death, what's going to happen? There will be topics that you're going to see that they are incrementally talk about just faith. Alhamdulillah, our Imam and the other speakers and who come to do khutbahs and dua give you a lot of teaching about ibadat and nafils and salawat. So, alhamdulillah, we have that covered. Maybe a lot of us know all the sunnahs we have to do. That's wonderful. Let's now strengthen our base, our foundation, through these topics about our faith and our deen. Remember, the aspects of Iman are six, but you can always add more to or break them down in different ways, and that's what our future speakers will be talking about it. Inshallah, every Jum'ah, this is your time, 8 a.m. until 9, 8 p.m. until 9 p.m. Salah time would be tweaked a little bit to accommodate, inshallah. So today we're gonna pray Aisha at nine, hopefully after the, uh, we're done with the session. Similarly, for the next three weeks, Next month, we're going to be announcing the topics before the month, so you know what we're going to talk about. And in the future sessions, Brother Naveed will be kind of measuring or assessing how successful this program by asking you a few questions at the beginning, anonymously, before the session, and then asking you the same questions at the end of the session, through Kahoot. So just grab your phone and answer them. A few Q&As, a few, sorry, multiple choices, just to see how we are presenting and are you benefiting from this inshallah and it's good for us to as have a feedback so that we can you know tweak the program modify it accordingly with that being said i'll ask brother navid again just to uh introduce the first topic and the imam and inshallah we're going to start the session so inshallah the first topic of the night will be proof of god's existence how do you know god even exists right the million dollar question of today richard dawkins to your, your science professor, your biology professor can't answer the question, but actually we can. And there are many arguments, inshallah the Imam will cover them, from the, con the contingency argument to the fine-tuning argument to so many logical arguments that, you are, that actually are found in the Quran and Sunnah. In fact, Ibn Sina, 
one of the scholars of our heritage created the contingency argument, which today people multiple faiths use to prove the existence of God, uh, so on and so forth. Inshallah, we'll, uh, today's speaker is going to be Imam Khalil, our beloved Imam. Uh, imam graduated from Dar al Uloom, uh, South Africa. Um, he did not send me a bio, so I'm just, just, just what I know of him. Uh, mashallah, uh, he is definitely very well acquainted with the community. He deals with the community every single day. He deals with the youth of this community every single day. And uh, I'd like to welcome him, inshallah, and begin the class. Today is proof of Allah's existence. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Jazakallah khair, brother Naveed, for that introduction. And uh, also, brother Hussam. <coughs> Okay, so can you guys see? All right. So this is the numbers. Just uh, uh, note it down, and inshallah, over the class or the session, if you have any questions, you can just text it to this number, inshallah. So as Brother Naveed mentioned, that today's topic is about the existence of God. And to begin with this topic and to start a discussion on this, there is, we have to take a couple of steps back. <clears throat> that how can we say that God exists? How can we say that God exists? So if everyone has this number, I will switch back to the slides that I have. So when we talk about the existence of God, it starts with our fitrah. Okay? It starts with our fitrah. Fitrah is the natural state that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created us all in. So fitrah actually comes from the word fatara, which means to cut and split open. And the idea is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, <coughs> He opened our hearts and He planted the seed of Iman within every single person. And every single person is hardwired, you can say, to recognize God from birth. So it is natural for a person to believe in God. Okay? Why? Because we Muslims, we, we believe in this thing called fitrah. That every single person has this fitrah. The, the natural state. <clears throat> so in the Qur'an, we see that this, there is this ayah where Allah says, فَأَقِمْ وَجْهَكَ لِلدِّينِ حَنِيفًا So be steadfast in faith, in all uprightness, O Prophet. فِتْرَةَ اللَّهِ الَّتِي فَطَرَ النَّاسَ عَلَيْهَا لَا تَبْدِيلَ لِخَلْقِ اللَّهِ The natural way of Allah which Allah has instilled in all people, not only in Muslims, not only in people who believe in Him like Ahlul Kitab, but this is in all people. لَا تَبْدِيلَ لِخَلْقِ اللَّهِ Let there be no change in this creation of Allah. وَلَكِنْ ذَلِكَ الدِّينُ الْقَيِّمُ This is the straight way. وَلَكِنْ أَكْثَرَ النَّاسِ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ But most people do not know. So from this ayah, it is clearly mentioned that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has, has created us, uh, us all in a natural way. There is this fitrah which is found within all of us. When we turn to hadith, we see that this hadith appears in Bukhari and also other places as well. Where Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu, he narrates from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who said, مَا مِن مَوْلُودٍ إِلَّا يُولَدُ عَلَى الْفِتْرَةِ there is no child, but he is born upon this fitrah. فَأَبَوَاهُ يُهَوِّدَانِهِ أَوْ يُنَصِّرَانِهِ أَوْ يُمَجِّسَانِهِ Then the environment molds him and, and changes him. Therefore, the concept of children being born 
innocent is there in Islam. There is no, nothing called the original sin in, in Islam. Children are masum. Okay? They have been born with this fitrah. Now yes, at times because of the environment that they live in or they are raised in, <coughs> uh, their fitrah does become a little cloudy. And that's what the Prophet is saying. Then he, he gives an example. And he, again, he's talking to the Sahaba um, who have animals. They're seeing these animals every day. They're using them in their farms as conveyance. They're eating them. So the Prophet he says, Kama tunjahul bahimata jam'a hal tuhissuna فيها من جدعة that when a, uh, when an animal gives birth to another animal do you see it that the hands are cut off right or or do you see any anything of that nature no it is born as a complete animal so similarly every single human is also born with this fitra we you will not differentiate between a Muslim who is born a Muslim or another person who who's not born in a Muslim family. Then the Prophet Sallallahu he referred back to this very same ayah which I recited in the beginning. So we see fitrah in the Prophet Sallallahu ahadith where he explains it even more. So another way of, <laughs> another way of explaining fitrah okay, is that you know we all have beliefs, right? We all have beliefs and we all have desires, okay? But some are of our beliefs are right beliefs. And we also have wrong beliefs. And we have desires. Those desires, some of them are good desires. And other ones are bad desires. <coughs> but if you were given a choice, that hey, why don't you choose? What, why don't you choose? What kind of belief would you want? Would you want to have a right belief or a wrong belief? Right. What would you say? Right. It's different what you have in mind of a right and a wrong belief, right? But no one will choose a wrong belief. Okay? You would always choose that you want to have the right belief. And when it comes to desire and the choice is given to you, you would always choose a good desire. So why is it that you choose this good desire? And why is it that you choose this right belief? It is because of that, that, that fitrah within you. And another example that the scholars they give is that at the time of difficulty, at the time of difficulty, it doesn't matter who you are, even if you're an atheist. The person says that even if there is a God up there, I'm, I'm calling out to you, please help me. All right, they say that there, there, there are no atheists in a, in, a, in, in a ship that's drowning. Right? Because everyone is calling out to any God that they know. So therefore, why is it that your inner self calls out to that God? You know, the most famous person who denied God in the Quran is who? Fir'aun, right? There were others before him as well. But the most famous is Fir'aun. But when he was drowning, what did he say? Right? The, in, his entire life he was against Musa salam, and he was saying, Ana Rabbukum al -ala. But at the ending, when he was drowning, what did he say? Uh, bihi banu Israel. Right? I bring Iman on the Lord of Banu Israel. So, <coughs> this is something which is ingrained within us. Yes, at times it becomes very foggy at times it becomes corrupt uh, because of the environment that we are in or we are raised in um, but then when we go back there is a way of cleaning that as well and going back to the reality as well so th there's a small picture over here where th where there's an astronomer he says I see no God up here he goes all the way up there and he says there's no God up here so the other guy he says yes when you lose your oxygen tank that's when you will call out to God Okay, so that was fitra. Okay, now let's get to another part. This is the covenant. Allah subhanahu wa taala He mentions in the Quran, 
وَإِذْ أَخَذَ رَبُّكَ مِنْ بَنِي آدَمَ مِنْ ذُهُورِهِمْ ذُرِّيَّتَهُمْ وَأَشْهَدَهُمْ عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ And remember the time when your Lord took from all the children of Adam from his back and he made them witness and he asked them this question أَلَسْتُ بِرَبِّكُمْ Am I not your Lord? And everybody unanimously said قَالُوا بَلَا شَهِدْنَا Right? And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said Now don't come on the day of Qiyamah saying that I did not know Thank you Don't say on the day of Qiyamah that I was unaware of this Okay Does anyone remember this oath or this covenant that they took? Right? You don't know You don't know, right? I mean, no one knows Is there anyone who knows? Okay So we don't know but we know through Quran that this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala this is the covenant that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took from us this was a promise and therefore the scholars they say that this promise which they called Misaq is Misaq and Fitra the same thing or are they two different separate things okay Allah is talking about we have there is another hadith where the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he goes more into detail, where where he says that Allah subhanahu wa taala he passes his hand over the back of Adam alayhi salam and all the children that are going to come till qiyamah they came out in forms of seeds, and that is when Allah subhanahu wa taala posed this question and they all responded, right? So this is before our birth a long time ago, but. This is the covenant that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took from all of us. So therefore the scholars, they say this fitra. Fitra is that natural state that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created within us. When He opened our chest, this is what He put within us. So every single person has the ability to understand the greatness of God. So much so that Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah, he writes that it is, it is natural to accept God and it is unnatural to ask if God exists. It's against your nature to ask if God exists or not. <coughs> so therefore, when our fitra is pure, when our fitra is pure, then our fitra leads us to God. And that paves our way towards Islam. But when our fitra is clouded, then that takes us away from God. And again, that takes us away from the truth, which is the false. <coughs> There's also a discussion amongst the scholars. They say that, w coming back to this hadith, uh, where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa he says, مَا مِنْ مَوْلُودٍ إِلَّا يُولَدُ عَلَى الْفِتْرَةِ That there is no one who, who is born, but he is born upon, upon fitra. They say, what is this fitra? It is Islam. So now, is, is fitra, misaq, and Islam the same thing? Right. So the answer to that is no. Your fitra, your, um, uh, your, your nature, will lead you towards Islam. It will lead you towards Islam. It's not that every child is born as a Muslim. No. Right. Every child is born with the understanding or with the capability to recognize that God created him. And then slowly, slowly he is taught Islam and Iman. Right? Therefore the Prophet ﷺ, he says that for the, for the first seven years, teach your children Iman. And then when they reach the age of seven, that's when you start teaching them Salah and the other pillars of Islam. So therefore, every person is not born as a Muslim. Every person is born on fitrah. Right? The ability to recognize that there is one God. So, now, let's talk a little bit. Now having said all of that, having learned a little bit about the fitrah, the misaq, now let us, uh, uh, let me ask you guys this question. 
and let's start thinking. Well, how were we created? How were you created? Give me some possibilities. Anyone? Give me some possibilities. How were you created? Come on guys, I'm not, I'm not giving a khutbah. In khutbah you're not allowed to talk. Yes? Through Adam alayhi salam, okay. Alright, we okay, that's one possibility, okay. Alright, yes. We were made from clay, yes. Okay, alright. Okay. That's there too. Yes, Brother Osman? We were created from sperm. Okay, so, so that's, 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 that's the obvious possibility, right? <laughs> that, is, that is our belief. That is our iman. That we were created from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through Adam alayhi salam and so on and so forth. But when you look at other arguments that come up with regards to our faith and about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and our creation, that how, how were we created? So there are different possibilities that you can come up with and, and this is one of the arguments that is presented to us. Um, it's also cause, called a cos cosmological argument. It is also called a kalam argument. Um, it was introduced by Imam Ghazali rahmatullahi he spoke a lot about it as well. And the idea is that in Surah Tur, in Surah Tur, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, أَمْ خُلِقُوا مِنْ غَيْرِ شَيْءٍ أَمْ هُمُ الْخَالِقُونَ And then He says, أَمْ خَلَقُوا السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضَ بَلْ لَا يُقِنُونَ Okay, Allah says, Allah mentions three possibilities here which people say with regards to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then the fourth one which all of you said is, it is the obvious. Okay, so the first one that we can take out from this is, أَمْ خُلِقُوا مِنْ غَيْرِ شَيْءٍ Okay, were you created from nothing? Is that a possibility? Can someone argue and say, no, we were created from nothing? Can, can someone say that? That we were created from nothing, it just, boom. There is nothing, we just came into existence. Right? You can't really say that. And, and, and logically, if you think about it, you know, or mathematically, if you think about it, you know, you have zero plus zero is always going to be zero. Okay? Nothing plus nothing is nothing. So, if you say that we came from nothing, meaning you're saying that you are nothing too, which is not a reality. We are something. So, therefore, we had to come from something. So you, can, you can't say that you came from nothing. So am khuliqu min ghayri shayin. So therefore Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, these are rhetorical questions. And in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks us these questions so that we can think about them. And we can ponder and reflect over them and come to the reality of the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So am khuliqu min ghayri shayin. So the first possibility is where you created from nothing, which is obviously wrong you can't say you were created from nothing because it doesn't make sense if you were created from nothing then you yourself are nothing the second is am hum al khaliqun did you create yourself did you create yourself are you, uh, it says uh, or are they their own creators meaning did you create yourself now pause and think over that how can you create yourself? Right? We're trying to figure out where is God in the equation. Right? Where does He come in? So the first one is, we didn't come from nothing. The second one is, did we create ourselves? Well, can you create yourself? Can you? So going back to the previous, you know, th this is very famous. What came first, the chicken or the egg, right? So it keeps on going back. When a person says, well... No, the egg came first. But where did that egg come from? Well, it came from the chicken. Well, where did that chicken come from? It came from the egg. And it keeps on going and it never stops. Right? So it has to stop somewhere. Right? 
So therefore, <coughs> you can't say that, okay, you, you were born through your mother and she was born through her mother and she was born through her mother. Well, it has to stop somewhere, right? You cannot create yourself. So again, it is a rhetorical question. The answer to that is obviously not. Because it does not make sense. Huh? Cloning, but even that, it needs to start from somewhere. All right. You know, uh, we, 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 we say, uh, what do you call that? The domino effect, right? The domino effect, I even that has a beginning. You need, you need some external energy to push something in order for it to happen. So, أَمْهُمُ الْخَالِقُونَ then the third possibility is Am خَلَقُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ Did they create the heavens and the earth? Well, our life on this earth, right? We can only be living if we were on this earth because of the mixture of those gases and the oxygen that we need to breathe. If we were slightly closer to the sun, it w we would be burnt, right? There, was, there would be no light, life. And if we are a little distant away from the sun, again, but everything is balanced and, 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 and fashioned so perfectly for our life to be fruitful, right? So therefore, am khalaqu samawat you cannot come before the heavens and the earth because how are you going to breathe? So did you create the heavens and the earth? Well, no. So all of these are rhetorical questions. Coming back to the fact that no, there has to be. All of these questions demand the fact there has to be an external power who created this. Okay? So therefore, uh, the final possibility is that you were created by God. Okay? And you, when you were created by God, that solves the entire puzzle and the problem and the equation balances there. Right? Yes. But like everything to fit in in its puzzle so perfectly, in such a balanced way, right? So, so, I mean, that's where that that that's where the the equation balances. So, so, <coughs> so again, this is where Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala He mentions, and again, this is just one argument. There are plenty of other arguments. Like I said, it starts from your fitrah. When your fitrah is clear, you have the capability, the ability to understand God. And um, to, to understand the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through your fitrah. And the more a person uh, goes away from fitrah because of the environment that they are in, the more difficult it becomes for that person to reach the truth. So going more a little bit more into depth in this argument so the 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 the, the premise a is everything that that began existence mun must have been caused by something right and the second premise is that the universe began to exist so the conclusion is that the universe must have a cause meaning the god uh, that brought it into existence okay So other than, uh, other than this proof, right, there are many other proofs that you will find um, when you talk about the different miracles of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that was, that was given to different prophets. When you talk about the morality, when you talk about contingency, that everything is contingent to um, something and that something must be Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there are... Uh, these are just uh, a list of different arguments that can be presented uh, to, to prove the existence of God. But the point is that all of these reach a person or help, a reach, uh, help to reach a person to understand the existence of God from different angles. 
The point is, so long as a person has a clean fitrah, so long as a person has a clean fitrah and tries to understand in different ways, you're looking at the same issue from different angles, you don't need to be a scholar to understand this. You are learning science or biology or other subjects in your school or in your class or whatever you have interest in. Look for God within that channel and you will definitely find Him. <coughs> so, um, it all comes back to your fitrah. The fitrah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created you with. Um, there is a narration of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa where he says that, you know, um, when a person sits down and he starts thinking about the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that is something that we should do. But it goes to a point where the person starts overthinking that if everything is created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then how is Allah created? Okay, so the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says at that point, you need to shut your, uh, your, your brains and you need to recite A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajeem Because Shaitan is always there to cloud up our fitrah that we have And again, during our life There will always be some points where our fitrah will be clear And at times, like our brother Hassan was saying That Shaitan is always going to come and he, his job is to put waswasa in you So that cloud can come any time Right? It's not only that when people start uh, becoming a little educated and start thinking about this, they leave Islam. No, there are people who live as a Muslim for years and they grow old in Islam and then they leave Islam too then. Right? So that cloud can come anytime. It is upon us to keep ourselves in an environment where our, uh, which is healthy for our fitrah, for our natural state and helps it to grow. So again, fitrah is different from Iman, fitrah is different from Islam, fitrah is our natural state that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created all of us in. And therefore, you know, in the salah we're constantly asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for guidance, right? We constantly want that guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because we can never ever say that I have enough guidance now. I have graduated, now I have enough guidance. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He tells us that we should continue to work وَعْبُدْ رَبَّكَ حَتَّى يَأْتِيَكَ الْيَقِينَ Continue to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala till death. Because, at, uh, because any time in the middle, your fitrah can be cluttered or your fitrah can be destroyed by the waswasa of shaitan and there goes your iman and your faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as well. So, with that, I will open up for questions, inshallah. The number. Okay, so this is the number. If you have any question, you can just put it on or text this number. Okay, so we have one question here. It's more of a Tuskia question, to be honest, but... Okay, so the person asks, Assalamu alaikum. So, if someone comes to you and tells you that they never worshipped Allah for the sake of Allah, but they did it to, to show off, basically, or to get someone's respect or approval, right? But now they feel guilty and they don't know how to kind of go back, reverse psychology, right? Fix the problem. Because they don't see the love of Allah, even when they're praying and reading Quran and so on and so forth. So how do you go about advising them? How do you encourage them to move their intentions towards Allah? How do you help them out? By the way, brothers and sisters, please do send your questions here. 716-247-6356. It's not my phone number, I promise. It's a phone number for the masjid, for this series. I will not know who is asking the question. We do not know who is asking this question. It's completely anonymous. Send your questions. Don't be scared. The Imam is here to help. Inshallah. <laughs> so, um, Shaitan gives waswasa in different ways. And he has many tricks in his sleeves. And one of those tricks is to make you feel like you have wasted your time. Okay, So it may feel like we are doing something for the sake of someone else. 
But the point is not to stop there. The point is to keep on moving. Keep on moving forward. And continue to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for that ikhlas. Continue to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the hidayah. Because really, no one can say they have the perfect level of ikhlas that is needed for their salah. Shaitan will always come and put that waswasa. Hey, someone is watching you praying. Are you really praying for that person or you're praying for Allah? Who are you praying for? Right? And, and when we look at the teachings of the Prophet ﷺ, we also find him saying that, you know, uh, sabyan abna sab'in. Teach your children about salah when they are seven. وَضْرِبُوهُمْ عَلَيْهَا وَهُمْ أَبْنَاءُ عَشْرٍ When they reach the age of ten, then you are even allowed to hit them, right? Or, or make the matter a little more serious for them. So now when, they, when your children see you, right away they understand that you're going to ask them about their salah, so they quickly pray their salah, right? Uh, so now the Prophet is not saying No, when they're 10 years old, leave them If they're not praying for the sake of Allah And they're praying for you, no, they should not be doing that No, you should keep on moving forward in life And continue to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala For that ikhlas And having that feeling of guilt within you Is something good, right? Because that feeling of guilt Is bringing you more closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala And that's the point of salah Okay, so therefore um, continue to do the good deeds that you are doing even if it's for the sake of someone else you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to change your intention and help you make your intention for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you know they say from, uh, from ada to ibada, right from a habit ada is ha- habit ibada is worship you need to take your actions from a habit to Worship and and uh, and practice makes better, you know. Inshallah. So next question, Imam. Um, it's pretty interesting. How can the order of the cosmos or the, uh, I guess, uh, kalam argument, right? How is there proof of Allah's existence? I, I'm going to add to the question as well because this is something atheists do bring up. Is that if if there is multiple universes, right? This is their argument, right? then there's infinite possibilities of randomness. And if you have infinite possibilities of randomness, one of those possibilities can bring forth a life-bearing universe. So how does like, the consistency, the kalam you know, argument, how is that proof of God's existence? So the way how I see it is that these are all rhetorical questions that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is asking us, which the answer is supposed to be no, there is only one God, right? Now, um, when you say that uh, uh, were you created from nothing, right? The answer is the more we think about this uh, and try to make sense out of this, it is that no, it is only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the point is not to, to think about this and get lost in these thoughts. Because coming back to the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, where he says that don't, uh, uh, he says, ponder over the, the, the sifat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the attributes of Allah, and don't ponder over the zat of Allah, the, 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 the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? So we, we, we begin this session saying that, you know, the million dollar question is to prove the existence of God. You know, God, uh, God exists uh, through our fitrah, that is how we recognize Him. And then there are different proofs that we get. There are a lot of scholars who, uh, who, who say that, you know, even in the Kalam argument, there are a lot of other intricate details which are over, overseen. For example, um, Ibn Taymiyyah actually mentions, he says that Allah does not really get that technical. Allah does not, Allah is very simple. And the way how he explains everything is very simple as well. So you don't need to get into all these big, long arguments that, you know, does Allah exist? How does Allah exist? He actually says that it's unnatural to even ask that question. Okay? Because your fitrah, you should be focusing on your fitrah and having that clean and clear to recognize that nur uh, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed within you. And wallahu a'lam. So, questioner asks, many non-Muslims I speak to say they are agnostic. They believe there is a catalyst for creation, but there is not a God in control, like all-powerful. What argument can we put on this topic? Um, 
basically we uh, we can use Quran, but then Imam, if we're speaking to like a coworker or to a friend or to a professor, they don't accept the Quran, right? That's that's where you already believe, so you accept it. So how do you talk to somebody out of this? So if there is someone genuinely asking you, um, and they they want they really want help, then what happens is they're they're more humble to under to to listen. But if there's a person who's just asking for the sake of asking, then there's n really no, it just goes into back and forth, right? Whatever you ask that person, he will, ha he will come back with a, a counter argument. So therefore, um, we as Muslims, the first thing, yes, we, we do live in a multicultural or multi-religious society where there are people who are, who believe in God, there are many people who don't even believe in God. The first responsibility that we have as Muslims is to make sure that I am preserving and protecting my faith. Don't go after protecting other people's faith while losing your own faith in the process. Right. So th that, that is my first advice. And the second advice is that, you know, when, when these kinds of questions are posed to you that... Uh, how do you prove the existence of God? I mean, that, that is a very big loaded question. And many a times you can just answer them by saying that this is my belief and this is my understanding. Right? And the final thing is that if that person really is, uh, uh, wants help and he is asking you and, and that person is very genuine, you answer him into the best of your ability in whatever way you can help him understand and ultimately ask him to pray to whichever God that he has or you know whoever he prays to uh, to give him that strength to understand uh, so that he can reach the truth Wallahu alam. so next question a uh, person says Assalamu alaikum um, wow okay Assalamu alaikum my question is Basically, does the Qur'an and Sunnah say anything by aliens? Are we the only creation of Allah? Is there anything to hint that there's other species out there? So on and so forth. Well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does say that وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ There are plenty of creations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but the ones that He calls insan, He's addressing us and then He calls jinnat. So these are the two distinguished creations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created for his worship um, everything else is subservient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it is in under the control of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be it animals be it plants be it the mountains everything else is under the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he does speak about different universes right Allah says uh, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen right so we are just in one universe. There, there, it could be that there are other universes and within those universes there are other human beings. Wallahu alam. Uh, our technology has not taken us that far yet. But Imam, can I oh. add to that question? Okay, Is it, so there are some reports, some riwayah that go back to, apparently, go back to Ibn Abbas, who it says that he believed there is uh, a multiverse. Do you know if those are authentic or not? I don't know off my head. Okay, we'll talk no, after. Okay. <laughs> um, okay, so this is a interesting one. Why is asking the kaifa or the how about Allah regarded as a bid'ah, as an innovation by Imam Malik? Okay, so yes, Imam Malik has regarded that to be a bid'ah. And the reason is that لَيْسَ كَمِثْلِهِ شَيْءٍ You know, to understand Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you would need a parallel, right? Uh, you would need an example words cannot describe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala there's nothing like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Allah is very unique so therefore uh, to understand the zat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the, the, uh, to understand Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself is beyond our comprehension we, we cannot really comprehend uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as a whole so therefore the Prophet ﷺ has prevented us from doing so because if a person continuously ponders and reflects over that then his iman can be uh, 
uh, his iman can be in danger, right? Because he may come to a point where he says, well, this is beyond me. Why would God create me and not show himself to me? Or why would God create me in a way that, you know, I cannot understand who he is? So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said that don't, don't worry too much about who and how Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala is. Rather, if you want to know Allah, know Allah through his beautiful names. Allah is the most Rahman. He is the most, uh, he is the one who shows the most mercy. Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala is Al Alim. He knows everything. And inshallah, we will have a whole session, a whole month just on the attributes of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. But if you want to know him, know him through his attributes. And another answer to that is, you know, we all have friends, we have family, and, and there are people who are within our circles. We like to be around certain people. And not, not really because the way how they look or something, it is because of how they behave or the qualities that they have. There are certain qualities that are found within people which are just, which attract other people to them. Right? You like someone because of that person's qualities. You hate someone because of the person's qualities or, 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 or the way how the person behaves. Okay? So similarly, if you really want the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you want to reach Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the way to understand Allah is through His attributes and qualities. And that is how you build the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala within you. So just thinking about the zat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the, the essence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is beyond our comprehension. So therefore, Imam Ahmad has also mentioned, uh, Imam, Imam Malik has mentioned, don't, uh, to, to ask too many questions about Allah Himself, it's a bid'ah. Right? It is something that no Sahaba has ever done. Right? The Prophet وسلم, discouraged us from doing so. So therefore, that is not the area of concern to us. Rather, we should be worried and thinking about other things. Inshallah. So this question goes kind of back to what Dr. Yassin brought up uh, regarding the ayah, have they created themselves? Then where does cloning stand from an Islamic point of view? What is a halal or haram? <laughs> I guess uh, if Allah is saying you can't create yourself, but then the scientists have actually cloned living beings, does that contradict the ayah? How do we understand the ayah from that reality? Wallahu mm. a'lam. I mean, you go after. So I repeat Brother Hassam's answer for everyone to hear. So So cloning is not Brother Hassam said cloning is not creating, right? Cloning is just what was the word? Proliferating an existing cell. Well Allah is saying that can you take nothing, can I take air in my hand and create a human being? I can't. So that's the argument. Now cloning is you already have a domino, you're just flicking it and getting other dominoes to fall, uh, for lack of a better example. So, Brother Hussam, you're the boss here. I have like over 10 questions that are like the skia and family problems. <laughs> so do we ask those questions or do we call it a night? So, inshallah, we're gonna have a whole, for those who texted the, you know, the skia questions, we're gonna have a whole month on the skia, but, Okay, uh, I'll, I'll take two more questions because they seem uh, interesting. Okay. So, Imam, how do you go about advising your immediate family about Islam or your younger siblings? Um, I think the best advice is action. Uh, be, become a role model for them. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu ku anfusakum wa ahlikum nara. Right? You, first, He starts off from yourself. And He says, O oh believers, Save yourself and your family from Jahannam. And the best way to do this is when you, are pra you yourself are practicing. 
and you yourself are making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for your family members, then that in and of itself is a big da'wah from your end. It's a big effort from your end. And ultimately, you know, just small reminders and, you know, just, just telling them, hey, I'm going for salah, would you mind joining? Or, or, or something of that nature. So the more we do this and the more dua we make to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, inshallah it will be beneficial. Speaking of dua, would you please give us a simple and effective dua to strengthen our iman? Our iman? So, okay, so there is a dua of the Prophet وسلم, where he says, Allahumma inni as'aluka imanan. Allahumma inni as'aluka imanan. La yartad, right? Oh Allah, I ask you for a, for such a strong iman that that doesn't take a U-turn and go away, right? Wa qalban khashia and a soft heart which is ready to accept uh, the nur that comes from Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. And there are multiple other du'as, but this is just a du'a that comes to mind. Um, but constantly making the, these kinds of du'as to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and asking Him to increase you in your iman and your faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it's, it's, uh, uh, it's important inshallah so one more question before we end okay it's about I, you know, I'm actually so happy because so many of the questions are about salah so that means that community loves salah alhamdulillah it's a kabir <laughs> so salam alaikum when you miss prayer because of the rush of work and you can't take a break and the guilt is strong what do you do when you what you you miss your salah because you're at work and it's hectic you can't take a break and then you end up like missing the for example okay. and you feel bad okay. what do you do okay. so uh, like i said when you feel bad that is something very good uh, because that 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 calls you closer to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and and feeling bad is 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 it's is the beginning it's not the end right so when you feel bad, you need to make sure that you, you do something about it. Uh, and that is the next time when the prayer salah comes, uh, comes about, um, the prayer time comes about, you must make sure that you make a plan for that before the time actually comes. Uh, so it's, uh, so our, it is a demand of our iman to make sure that we are praying our salah. Because our salah strengthens our iman. And with a strong iman, you will have quality salah. Okay. So, uh, yeah, so the quick answer to that is just make sure that you have a plan for your salah before the time of salah actually comes. Many a times, you know, in the winter it becomes very tough and difficult because all of your salah are jammed in, in, in your work time. Uh, but, you know, being a little proactive and making sure that uh, you have a plan for your salah before the time actually comes in uh, is, is very helpful. But mo majority of the time what happens is we get so caught up in work that uh, we start worrying about salah when there's only five minutes left. Um, so obviously that's not going to be helpful at all. So just have a plan before the time comes. So when the time comes, you have wudu, you, have, you, you can go and pray somewhere, inshallah. All right. Jazakumullah khair, everyone, for attending our first session of Fountain of Faith. Uh, inshallah. Imam, can you just put up the, the number real quick? So... Uh, I would request if everyone can please text their feedback to the number the Imam is going to put up in a second. Um, again, this is an amana. You have my word. I have no clue who's texting. Okay, and I actually, as soon as I ask the question, I don't have the password right now. Oh, okay. I, I, do I even have it? So, uh, inshallah, after salah, we'll, we'll announce the the number again. After I ask the question, I delete the question. I delete the number. Please do not feel any hes hesitancy. Oh, there it is. 716-247-6356. Please, please, please text your feedback. Uh, let us know how you felt about the session. Do you feel like we, if you feel like we didn't do a good job, just tell us straight to our face. We'll fix it, inshallah. Because we're here for you. We're here for the community. This initiative is not just another dars, not just another lecture. We really want this to be something exceptional, something the Buffalo community has not seen before. We really want this to be a scholarly endeavor, inshallah, to answer your tough questions. Please, please send your feedback. Uh, whatever it is, we will take it wholeheartedly. Hassam and I and Imam and Dr. Yasin are going to sit down 
you know, beat our heads against the wall, look at your comments, and inshallah, only improve with every single se uh, uh, session. Jazakallah khair, everyone. Inshallah, if, if you can have one of the shabab give the adhan, that would be beautiful, inshallah. Yes, so next week's uh, session, inshallah, today we learned, okay, like how do you prove there's a God? Okay, you prove there's a God. Next week's session is, how do you prove it's Allah? Like, who, who is, like, what is your God? Who do you worship? How is that God, that one creator of the universe, how is it Allah? Why can't it be like Jesus? Why can't it be like Krishna? Why does it have to be Allah? Right, and that is next week's session, inshallah, with a guest uh, imam, uh, with the guest speaker, inshallah. Our goal is, inshallah, every week to have a diversity of speakers, a diversity of MCs. The Shabbat will be taking over in my spot, inshallah. And um, inshallah, inshallah, once every quarter, we hope to bring in uh, an outside speaker, maybe Shaykh Yasser Qadi, who knows, right? Make dua, um, inshallah, for the benefit of our community. Again, Jazakumullah khair. Wassalamu alaikum. Oh, and refreshments, of course, right? Refreshments are in the back. Coffee, tea, uh, have your refreshments, inshallah, and join us for Salah at 9.15.